Chris, are you doing? Oh, yeah, yeah, we are doing fine. Yeah. Sorry, what, what, what's your daughter's name? I, 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 I wanted you to get her on this uh, show that you have. <laughs> Sorry, what, what, what's your name again, please? Hi, I'm Neo. Neo, nice to meet you. Sorry? Neo. Neo. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Fine, no, yeah. And we're, we're just, just so show. you guys know, we are broadcasting, so, yeah. you know. Okay. Be appropriate, Ram. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Doug. Yes, I shall try, I shall. I feel very much yeah, thank, and thanks for joining us last minute. Um, we're not yeah. starting yet. We have a couple of minutes to go. Yeah, okay. uh, I just opened up the webinar so people can come in and say hello. Uh, you might have to actually relegate everyone to the other status because I see there's a pen on my screen because I think I gave uh -oh. my, my wrong link. <laughs> That's okay. I'm going to relegate that person to... Mm. So how's the uh, daily room? Sorry, I'm in Bangalore. As in, are you in Bangalore today? Yeah. yeah no, I live in Bangalore. I live in Bangalore. Yeah. Oh, you live in Bangalore. All right. Yeah. Okay. Why yeah. do you think yeah. you're in Delhi? So, is Bangalore good today? Yeah. Where are you guys? Yeah, you are, it's uh, getting yeah, into the spring. Weather. Sorry? So, you're getting into spring. You're in spring now, right? No, here it's almost now. Yeah, it's pretty close to winter in Bangalore. Uh, but we have the other side of the There's equator. never winter uh, where you are. Yeah, I know. It's, yeah, there's uh, no winter. There's really no winter. But in Bangalore, there is a little bit of it. Yeah, not too much of it. But there's a little bit of it. I'm um, everyone, to my, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. As uh, There's people joining already. So just uh, please bear with us for another minute or two. And as you are joining us, please, uh, in the chat, let us know where you are joining us from. And we are recording, so people who don't get to attend live will get a chance to watch this later. So don't fret if you need to run. We will be here. Uh, Kuwait, India, where else are you guys from? USA, awesome. I'm in Chicago. Our speakers today, our panelists are joining us from South Africa. I'm Stellenbosch. <laughs> oh, don't. Do that. <laughs> <laughs> that just, hmm. you know what? You guys go have your wine. I'm going to <laughs> just sit here jealously. That's not fair. Um, anybody else joining from a vineyard, please tell me so that I can also, <laughs> I was gonna say send bad vibes your way, but I won't. I'll just send jealous vibes. <laughs> Oh, hi, Singapore and Greece. Um, cool, we are at the time that we're supposed to be starting, so I will kick us off. Um, this is our second session today. I'm very, very excited. Welcome, everyone, to Awake, Aware, Arise, our five-week-long online conference, event, summit, etc., where every single day we will come to you three times a day with different speakers from around the world, talking about life and the world and how we can make it better. Um, in some sessions, you will hear from coaches and you'll hear, you know, some more theoretical stuff. And in other sessions, like the one today, you will hear stories and hopefully come away um, with some parallels in your, in your own life and with some inspiration. I know that I will. The, the times that I've uh, seen Ben's contributions to the world slash spoken to him. I definitely felt inspired. And um, this is his daughter, Neo. So Neo, pressure's on you. <laughs> <laughs> you are the future. You're the next generation, okay? Pressure, what your pressure. dad is in the past. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're looking at you. <laughs> so welcome, everyone. My name is Magda. Um, our session now today is about the hero's journey. And more specifically, the specific hero's journey of Ben Kobisang, is that how you say it? That's correct, yeah. Cool, close enough. Magda Valjak, Walzak, you know, it varies. So Ben Kobisang and his daughter, Neo. So um, this is going to be quite an informal session. So as we go along, if anyone has any questions, any comments, please be as engaged as you want on the chat. I will be the monitoring. 
um, just uh, make sure you select all panelists and attendees when you leave your comments and questions so that everybody can see them. Uh, but other than that, we're just going to see where the where this hero's journey takes us and and go from there. So maybe let's let's kick off with some introductions. Um, ben and Neo, do you want to tell us who you are and where you are and why are you here? <laughs> All right. My name is Ben. Thanks, Marcia. And Neva, thank you for being here next to me. It's, uh, it's my first time ever sharing a stage with Neva. So it's quite, it's quite special from that point of view. And it's uh, all Rome's fault. Um, so a little bit about me. So I was born in 1970. Uh, so apparently all great people are born in 1970. So I just turned 50 the other day on the 23rd of August. And I hail from uh, Soweto, which is probably the biggest uh, township in, uh, that started in apartheid uh, South Africa. And I started school in 1976. And 1976 has been journaled uh, throughout the world as a student uprising. So it was in that era that I suppose I started school I had the privilege of winning myself a scholarship that uh, took me to St. Stidian's College, which is one of the uh, top private schools in South Africa. And I studied to become a chartered accountant, so I'm a CA, and I've been in the investments arena for 25 odd years now. So I've worked uh, for big uh, listed uh, corporate institutions. Um, so I spent about 10 years in uh, public markets management. I spent the next 15 uh, combination. Uh, so I worked for Mutual, uh, which is <clears throat> one of the big financial services companies from Africa, listed also on, uh, on the JSC. And um, I suppose my claim to fame is I was a managing director of Mutual Property which then was probably, uh, I don't know, top three real estate uh, business. We did regional retail shopping centers. And uh, I've spent time uh, managing director of Stanlib. Uh, so yeah, so I've spent time in the C-suite, I guess, to get a long story short. And after 25 years, I decided I learned what I could out of corporate and I decided to venture into the world of uh, entrepreneurship. So I started a business called uh, Alt Capital Partners and for Alternative Capital Partners we are impact investors. So fundamentally I'm a social capitalist so I believe in doing good while we make money and I suppose some of the problems in the world that I'm trying to solve uh, is three, three businesses that we've set up. One is about Economic infrastructure, as you guys know, South Africa and actually Africa has got an energy challenge. So I'm all about renewable green energy. So we invest in, in renewable energy uh, projects, but water, transport and ICT. So all bulk economic infrastructure. The other business we do social impact property with. So there we try to solve problems of uh, the unequal uh, human settlements that exist in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So we do what we call affordable housing, which is a uh, high density, multi-family uh, type of dwellings, where we're just hoping through our investment activities to just restore dignity in terms of how people live, work and play. We do co-living, which is my solution to the millennials even though Neva will tell me just now that she's not a millennial. Uh, but what we're doing is that we're recognizing that uh, given where uh, real estate prices have done in the last 20 years is actually quite unaffordable for entry level uh, workers to afford to buy homes. So what we do then is we buy office buildings and we convert that into apartments. And uh, we call it core living because it's about realizing that the one problem we're also trying to solve in the world is people feeling lonely or isolated. So our solutions are about creating uh, neighborhoods or neighborhoods. 
And then we also do convenience retail in townships and rural areas, which for us, it's about taking the economy to the people because in South Africa through uh, apartheid spatial planning, uh, there's a disconnect and people have to travel long distances to places of work. So we then trying to bring their essential services to them so that they can save money and have more time to live a life of dignity. So that's kind of like what we do. And the last part of the business is all ventures, which is where we support uh, entrepreneurship, but we focus on the small to medium sized entrepreneurs. So the people that generally don't have access to big money or their formalized capital. So we are then trying to unblock those blockages in terms of firstly connecting uh, developed capital or formal capital to those opportunities, but at the opportunity level, capacitating entrepreneurs through financial literacy so they can learn how to read balance sheets and do business planning and stuff like that. And also other blockages that come through coaching or training and development to really capacitate them to do what they do, which is to be entrepreneurs, build businesses, create employment and catalyze economic development. So that's me in a nutshell. But my that's a long nutshell, but it's really funny because <laughs> as you're talking, I'm just looking at the hero's journey. I'm like, yep, so we understand your call to adventure, what the ordeal was, then we understand, um, <laughs> you know, how you transformed and finally the hero's return and what your three businesses via your venture firm, what you're doing. So, um, okay, cool. Session's done. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> Um, and Leo, tell us about you. And you're not a millennial, you're Gen Z, Gen yeah, Z, Z Gen in the world. I was born in 2000, so technically Gen Z. Um, my introduction's a lot shorter, don't worry. <laughs> 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 so, hi, my name is Noah Kuni Sang, Ben's daughter. Um, so, as I said, born in 2000, uh, first lived in Cape Town. So, I was born in Cape Town, lived there for the first 12 years of my life, which was very unique experience um, and then after that I went to high school at St. Mary's Girls School in Johannesburg um, followed by that I did a productive gap year in which I studied A-levels for a year and then this year I'm currently studying my first year at university, Stellenbosch University in particular, hence why <laughs> we're amongst oh, the minions. <laughs> okay, got um, it. <laughs> yeah and I'm busy studying visual arts a degree and I'm majoring in finance. Oh, amazing. I'm very, very jealous. Have I said it before that you're in Stellenbosch? <laughs> oh, the wine we could have. Um, I see Ram is back. Excellent. It's so great to have both of you here. And um, I do want Ram to jump in because like, like Ben said at the beginning, uh, it's Ram's fault that both of you are here. <laughs> and while I have an idea of what you mean, I would love Ram to tell us what inspired uh, him to invite your daughter along with you, Ben. Oh. Uh, Ram, hold on. And I can't unmute you. I don't know why. Hold on. I'm going to, don't touch anything. I'm going to try. Ready? Oh, good. We're here now. Yeah, you can hear me now. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, yeah, when I spoke to Ben, um, in, in some ways, um, what came up to me was, uh, I, I, well, uh, certainly I, I, I didn't go through the same trials and tribulations that Ben, you did. Um, certainly, probably I had a much more, let's say, comfortable uh, journey in my, uh, if at all, if it was a hero's journey, yours is much more of a hero's journey than mine. Um, but what, what, what was, uh, uh, it was very interesting when you said that you have a um, college going daughter who, who's about to enter university. I think that's what I remember at that time. Um, what's, what's her perspective on what you are now? And would she want to follow that kind of life uh, or the path that you took, becoming a chartered accountant, becoming whatever you are in the financial world and all that? Because for whatever reason, I, I remember that um, one of the things that uh, 
my daughter said very early in her life, when she was even in her mid school, that um, she didn't want to be anything like me in the corporate space. Um, we never really <laughs> got discussing uh, too deep into, the, uh, into that kind of a thing, but basically uh, I felt it meant that um, uh, there wasn't sufficient work-life balance or integration and stuff like that. And I still remember later, much later when she went to college, um, she went to the US, she, got into NYU on a pretty prestigious program. And she had an option to go into the management school Stern. And uh, she said, no, I'm not going to do that. So, um, and, and it, one of the things that I constantly uh, kept hearing at various points in time was that don't try to live your dreams through me. Um, so that kept a check on in terms of what, um, in terms of even any advice or anything that I wanted to give or a different perspective of how um, one's own children, especially one's daughters, uh, look at us. So that's why I was very curious at that point in time. Uh, what if, if there was a conversation uh, between the two of you? Um, so I, I'll stop here at this point in time. So I'd be much more um, interested in hearing your daughter's point of view than your point of view on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, one thing I'm very grateful about is the fact that um, my family has granted me the privilege to always chase after what I am passionate about. And personally, I wouldn't I wouldn't go into the finance sector because it's just not something I'm passionate about. <laughs> uh, there have been many many experiences, uh, especially around about grade eight, grade nine, when you had to take EMS. And my dad and I we would have these little bickering moments because he's trying to teach me. EMS is like, you should know this. This is what I do. <laughs> and for the life of me, I just, I, I understood it, but I just, it, it wasn't something that I could enjoy. So I've always been passionate about like the arts and everything. So I definitely would chase that before, long before I go to finance. <laughs> but I quite like my dad's, um, the way he encountered life in the sense that he first established himself within a company, but he was still very, you know, he stuck to his, his core and his, you know, things that he valued. And instead of forfeiting all of that, just for the corporate nine to five lifestyle, he did make the change to chase something that he was passionate about and become an entrepreneur. So that's one thing I really do respect. So I think in that sense, I might, follow that uh, wave of life because I think that is a really it's a special kind of experience to have as you get older because then first you you learn how to fit, fit within a society how to work as a unit teamwork and you establish yourself and you learn from others and it's a very great space to do that within a company but then once you've established yourself you know, just kind of setting out and being able to share all that you've learned with other people and start something really amazing and impactful. I think that is a really special journey to go through. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm curious, you talked about, you know, what your dad has done uh, professionally. I'm curious how you think about the beginning, beginning, of his hero's journey, the the hard part. I mean, Ben, I think you said you were 12 when you got that scholarship to, yeah. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. Yeah, so it's a very long time between, you know, starting your, gain the opportunity to start building your life, which you've done amazingly. Um, you know, I come from a small village in Poland. Um, my parents are amazing and I had the most amazing childhood. But, you know, now that I'm an adult and I understand the sacrifices they had to make and um, the limitations that we had under communism, I mean, things like if you wanted to make dinner, you went to the garden and picked the vegetable. And if you wanted chicken soup, you killed the chicken. Um, <laughs> like these things didn't occur to me as not normal when I was growing up. And now I understand that they aren't normal. But what's even more, more interesting is that there's a nostalgia now for that kind of lifestyle. So I've actually come full circle and my, my uh, growing up is now privileged in a different way. So 
point is I'm lucky. Thank you, parents. Um, but it's been an interesting journey for me to think about my own parents' heroes' journeys and the sacrifices and the transformation they had to go through uh, in order for me to have the life that I have. So I'm really curious, Neo, like how, how does that, in, how has it impacted you? Has it, how do you think about dad's origin story? I think it's a really, it's a really amazing story. And it's, it's quite interesting because I find quite a few parallels with our uh, experiences in the sense that, you know, he, you know, setting out into school that it wasn't that mixed, you know, there was still quite a bit of like racial disparity. It's a new space to be in. You have to find a sense of community within that space, except for me, I experienced it a lot earlier because, you know, I grew up in the suburbs in Cape Town. It was a majority white place, you know, even the school that I went to, it was majority white. So there weren't that many, you know, kids with like same complexion as me. So with kind of like forming my identity within that space, that was uh, quite an interesting journey for me. So I realized one thing that it's taught me is that um, I've, I seek out like people versus, uh, from, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I seek relationships with people. So I care more about what they have going on inside and how, like, what their view of the world is. And that's more uh, an, of an attractive trait to meet someone and spend time with someone than necessarily the color of their skin, which I find is pretty interesting. But, I mean, my dad has come a very long way. And I think his experience of saints and moving into varsity and all the stories that he's told me about finding identity there it's it's really interesting because there's this one story that he tells me uh, quite often is when he first got to university uh, he went to university at peter maritzburg and this was still very early on there wasn't too much diversity as well so when it came to the little things such as eating lunch you know there was segregation within those spaces so now uh, my dad being from Saints, you know, he's used to a mixed group of friends, you know, if you like the person you sat with them, you enjoyed their company, it wasn't necessarily based off of race. So now he walks into the dining hall and he has to make this decision. Does he sit with his white friends or does he go to a strangers group full of black kids, you know, because he is black, you know? So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's interesting things like that so just like the way you see the world and basically not allowing the world to just be a black and white space that about his journey has been quite memorable for me yeah. well, hmm. i guess at the core we were inspired by dr king but uh, i'll say that I mean, life has to evolve, right? So my parents, my dad sounded like your parents, as in they were, my mom was a nurse, my dad an electrician. So they were kind of like middle class and to, they believed to pivot out of the, uh, the poverty cycle was all about uh, giving your kids the best education. So I'll say myself and my siblings had the best for my parents from that point of view, but at the core, they, taught us love and taught us right and wrong and taught us to think for ourselves, okay? So I know a lot of people maybe find me too argumentative or too much of an activist, but I just never accept, right? Uh, you, I have to find my own truth. Um, and that is important for me to live my own truth. So equally, I guess with Neil, um, as we were thinking about uh, being a parent. So what is our parental philosophy? And yes, at the core was to clearly provide her with the basics uh, that we could, to roof of her head and food of the table and stuff like that. But ever since she was young, I left work <laughs> at the gates of the house when I came in. And inside when she was young, I was dead. I mean, I used to play, or she used to wake me up very early on Saturday mornings, to play Barbie Barbie because then she was the only kid and I could play Barbie Barbie and uh, but what it did though it, it was giving me balance right because she actually helped slow me down because then the day job was high velocity because 
there was big stuff that we were doing and at home she slowed me down to smell the roses and connect with Bobby Bobby, stop to smell the roses and make me chase after rivets that uh, she couldn't contain. And I mean, that type of stuff. But then at the core of it was like saying, as a, as a, as a girl, the type of woman, I guess, that we wanted to catalyze or to help create was, was that. An independent woman who knows love can make her own choices and those choices not being informed by the limitations of the barriers that as society or humans, we tend to impose in terms of race, gender, religion, because, and, and I mean, to not just say to, to get it to grow up in a colorless world, no, but to get her to inform her choices of friendships or her choices based on content of the human beings that she comes across that resonates with her energy as opposed to any other form of definition that unfortunately we tend to color as we look at the world from the lenses that informs it. Um, I like that you have this purpose uh, in mind for raising Neo and that's pretty awesome. Um, I'm wondering if there are some from Neo's perspective, are there some like overhangs potentially from your dad's past that you are seeing? And um, I don't have to ask this question, so give an example. I'm better with examples. So my parents, especially my dad, um, even though, you know, they're now in their 60s, uh, everyone is good. They, my dad has a successful construction business. Um, they're, they have no mortgage anymore. Like everyone's healthy. My dad will go out of his way to buy petrol, fuel, gas, like way, I don't know, 20 minutes out of his way because it's in the end, maybe 3% cheaper than the one that is by his house. And where that comes from is like my parents, they had nothing growing up. Um, I was much more fortunate, but I, like we'd be considered, you know, poor, I suppose, um, in comparison, but my parents literally had nothing. Um, and with my dad, you know, his, um, his dad left their family when my dad was pretty, when he was little, I think he was five, I want to say. Um, so yeah, my parents have this ingrained, if, well, my dad, if you can go and save that cash, great, do it. And I'm just like, dad, but your time is also worth money. The fact that you're going out of your way and in the end, like how much are you going to save? A dollar here, here's a dollar. He's like, no, you don't understand. I'm like, no, I don't understand. <laughs> so I'm curious. Um, Neo, what don't you not understand? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, I mean a couple of things, but I think slowly as I've gotten older, I've gotten to understand them better. So for one, it's money. I know whenever I used to go to school, I'd be like, dad, please can I have some money for tuck shop because there wasn't food in the house or there wasn't a meal to make or we had a fancy day and we just wanted something nice to eat. Um, I remember at the end of the day, my dad would always be like, where's my change? <laughs> <laughs> so that type of money conscious nature, I think I definitely picked up. So even when it comes to varsity, I'm like, can I spare this amount of money to buy this? And it doesn't necessarily mean that, no, I like don't have any to spend, so I have to do it. I think it's just, they've always taught me how to, both my parents always taught me how to save and uh, save for the future. So I've already got like a savings account that I already um, save to monthly. And it's that kind of thing where it's just valuing money and that kind of thing, but not necessarily uh, in like a materialistic way. It's just kind of to grow yourself and just help support yourself later on in life. So that independence mm. definitely is gained through money in that sense. Um, and another thing as well, it's my dad's adventurous nature. I know he has stories uh, growing up, just being able to roam free, hiking. He was a very sporty kid. Uh, do squash, do cross country as well. Yeah, cross country, lots of sports. Um, so one thing that I really treasure growing up, especially in Cape Town, is on the weekends we do all these activities. Sometimes we go hiking into Kai Forest or different forests or just the mountains really. Uh, and sometimes you go cycling. Cycling was our bonding experience, which was 
really nice. As a, a side note, it taught me a lot <laughs> about, you know, if you're in hot water, you just got to keep going because otherwise you're stuck in hot water. There's this particular time when we were cycling, I think it was mm. to Kai Forest, mm. and there was this, uh, I don't know what you'll call it, this group of uh, balloons, yes. and the trail was in the middle of them. On the left-hand side, there were these two males fighting. On the right-hand side, there were all the mothers with the babies, and you know, with the mothers, they're overprotective. So <laughs> he literally looked at me before we started cycling down that part, and he was like, whatever happens, don't stop. <laughs> don't panic first. Don't panic, just don't stop. <laughs> and then he flies down the path. <laughs> and I think I was about like 10 at the time. And I'm busy cycling through it. And now the baboons are coming closer to me. And I was like, okay, don't panic, don't stop. Don't panic, don't stop. <laughs> so definitely uh, stop like that. Uh, just, I understand. It's like a metaphor for life, isn't it? Just have to be yourself <laughs> yeah. and keep going, no matter yeah, what exactly. baboon mothers are protecting their babies at you or what <laughs> crazy males are fighting. Okay. Um, Ram, uh, maybe you want to jump in here, uh, but, but both you and Ben, since you've raised such wonderful children, um, how has coaching been a part or has it been a part of parenting? Because I, you know, I've had the pleasure uh, for the past few years to meet some offspring of our amazing coaches um, through different interactions. And I think, I think it shows that your parent is a coach. Um, maybe they're more well-adjusted, more self-reflective, not sure. But I'm curious, Ram and Ben, have you done anything differently um, that we can learn from? So I... Uh... Sorry, in our, in our chat uh, the other day, Mark, uh, I said I did uh, make kind work, right? Uh, but without getting into it, it's, it's process work to uh, get us as men to understand that we are hunters and we need to treat our gatherers with the necessary respect that goes with it and teach us accountability. But anyway, so during my mankind weekend, uh, the one blockage that I didn't realize was a blockage until I did that process work was we had to uh, do the human gauntlet. So Kelly is just men because it's mankind. <laughs> so there was a human gauntlet uh, where men basically made a, a barrier. And our instructor said, you need to run through this. And Kelly was standing in line and uh, I saw people being successful at it. And I realized that in my subconscious, I actually decided that this task was too difficult. So I told myself, I'm not going to make it through this human conflict. So, yeah, but I set with force when we started and in the middle, I stopped. And then the moderator or the process owner uh, called me out in there to say, what is this all about? And I said, what are you talking about? And then I did, and he made me do it again and the same thing. But through process, I realized that my blockage was because I'm a perfectionist. Um, uh, so my blockage was fear of failure, right? So uh, the unintended thing is I never gave my best because I didn't want to fail. And then when, she's, when he slowed it down to the root, I realized it was my daddy issue, right? Because then I had a project when I was nine years old that I had to do, and my dad being an electrician is a handy person. I'm all the nerd, and uh, when I asked him for help, he got impatient with me, and he ended up uh, doing it for me, which basically uh, set a path for my life, uh, which is why I hate physical work. So my life language is definitely not uh, physical work, which is my wife's uh, life language, <laughs> uh, which is interesting. So fast forward then, <clears throat> to, I suppose the point is we all have blockages in life and normally we need process work to help us see it, understand it, so that we can then actually do something about it. Um, so when I was at our mutual properties, it was the first time personally I came into contact with coaches. Actually, I was doing my fellowship with Duke University and uh, the University of Cape Town's business school at the time. Uh, it was called Emerging Leaders Program and, and they introduced coaching to us and I was working through 
my gender biases at the time. So I chose a female coach. It was that female coach that recommended mankind work because her husband had actually done the work. So, so it was through that introduction, I guess, of saying that in life, it is good for one to know what you don't know. And the catalysts that help you see what you don't know and help you vision or plan or dream or whatever uh, your own status is and actually hold you accountable to the things that you commit to. So, so that is what I see as coaching. So, and uh, so I adopted it. So in my business, I mean, I, I fell in love with coaching actually, because I found out today, Ram, that uh, one of your uh, coachy mentors <laughs> is a lady that used to work for me. So she was telling me today that you coach hair coach is how she uh, described it. And she was doing specialty retail, retailing for us and came to me and told me how she wanted to do coaching. And so I've always been a democratic leader that uh, believes in people operating within the passion areas. So I supported her and today she's a global coach operating out of uh, Chile <laughs> of all places. Uh, so I've always believed in coaching, I suppose, and in business, we are coaching. So my leadership style is exactly that. So I see my job in terms of uh, visioning and uh, rallying people to true north and unleashing the energy that's required to get them to, to move and capacitating them in terms of support to that point and holding them accountable, right? And uh, with all the levers. So I see myself as a business coach. That's what I do for a living. I mean, what do I do? I do, I do coaching for a living. Because to me, business is about people. So unless you understand the psyche of people and how systems work and how you can get people to move, right? That's why I'm saying don't panic and don't stop moving. It's, it's a one philosophy that I apply to everything. And as a marathon runner, I don't panic, it doesn't matter how tough the race is, and I never stop. I mean, you can stop and walk, but you never stop, <laughs> because then you start going backwards. But it's about, it's about movement. So I'll say coaching, yeah, in many ways, has played quite an important uh, yeah, part in just how I lead and what I try to do. And I try to do the same with Noah, basically. So I've never imposed my wishes on her, because I've always understood it's her life. She's accountable for it. And my job is to capacitate the manifestation of whatever her dreams and ambitions are. So I'll say what Reggie and I did as parents was just to watch. So we watched now, as in where was her interest? And wherever her interest took her, I mean, we'll test it and support it and encourage it. And sometimes it was great, sometimes it does not. I mean, she made me women buy a piano because she was a promising musician and the piano still stands. And I don't know when last you played this piano. And again, <laughs> she told me she had a bad teacher that took away that passion. But the point is exactly that. As a parent, just watch, observe, support, and encourage. So personally, I know she gets excited when she gets uh, A plus grades, whatever. So I try not, clearly I'm happy for her, but I try not to overplay it because I don't want her to, to shoot for overachievement to, I guess, the same extent that it became my shadow because uh, fear of failure or achievement was my blind spot. So I tried to get her to be as relaxed as she can be so that she's driven by passion as opposed to fear, so that she runs towards as opposed from. And a big fundamental difference between, I suppose, those two starting points. But yeah. Can you say a little bit more? <laughs> one thing uh, that's quite similar between my dad and I is the perfectionism thing. I'm also a great perfectionist. So I totally understand when he says, you know, one thing that stops you from achieving is the fear of failure. So I think in that sense, he's been really great at coaching me through that and just helping me get through that fear because he's been there, he's experienced that. And what one thing I really appreciated is the fact that he shared stories with me about how he had to overcome it and that the struggles he experienced. Because I think a lot of the time with parents, you know, you try to shield your kids from everything that you experienced. So you don't really tell them about it. So they don't see you as like a human, a regular person, because it's this, you show them like your, 
ideal self, essentially, which I find to be quite interesting. So in that sense, he was a very great coach for me because then we could relate very honestly and openly. But yeah, so that's one thing that I got to experience mainly around about 2016 and onwards, which was great. So yeah. So you're saying that uh, he wasn't trying to be his ideal self and he was willing to be vulnerable with his fear. Is that what you're saying, Neil? Yeah. Yes, definitely. The vulnerability was one thing that just helped us to connect a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and just it made the advice so much easier to take because it's one thing having someone preach to you what you should do and giving you advice in that sense. And it's another thing, someone actually sitting down and telling you, I've been there. So this is what I've experienced and this is what helped me get out of that. So, yeah. Because it's fundamental, right? I mean, Ren, you, you did YPO and in, in process, I guess I say we should not advise because advice is demeaning to human beings because it assumes that they are incapable of solving problems themselves. But the richness comes in shared experience, if that makes sense. No, absolutely. Yeah. Advising, um, directing, providing somebody a solution, which means that they cannot discover it themselves. They lose the joy of doing that themselves. These are the things which actually limit people. But what I, I mean, two things. One is when you, when you talked about, yeah, yeah, uh, in terms of, uh, there were some words that you used that will come back to me in a minute, but, um, it's much easier to be a business coach, uh, an executive coach, whatever it is, than being a coach to your children. It's, it's, it's a lot more difficult, uh, pretty obviously, because um, first of all, there's a lot more at stake in many ways. And you are really walking the razor's edge in many ways. <laughs> you really don't know how much of what you say is going to be accepted. You, you, you cannot be uh, as disengaged as you could be with an external client or a, a business person. And, uh, but, but like what you said, that uh, it was a, you offered it, okay, if you wish to take it, you take it. Um, this is what I've experienced, what I heard you know, say, that that's probably the best way to do that. But what I'm curious though is that you came from a space where literally you pulled yourself up by your bootstraps and struggled through a large part of your life. Now, in spite of that, when you say that you have a fear of failure, um, I'm just curious as to where, where that is coming from, because th- that's, that's what you have probably faced all through your life and been successful as well. So is, is that actually working for you as uh, an energy which is pushing you forward uh, rather than something that is holding you backward? Such a good question. Um, so in one of our uh, ESCO offsites, um, one of my colleagues said to me that in, our, in the one-to-one feedback sessions, to say that he thinks I'm such a brilliant oak but then he also doesn't understand my erratic behavior. And he framed it to say that I self-sabotage, which picked my curiosity because no one actually had said that to me before. So I asked him what 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 he meant and he explained it from his worldview, which then made me to go back and reflect, I guess, the origin. So what I, so I took it back to when I was, I don't know, probably six, seven, eight, somewhere thereabouts. And I was inherently, I'm a contradiction. So inherently lazy, but very industrious. So I must have found out clearly that I was smart at some point, but I refused to come first. And literally it was a conscious choice. And I was comfortable with being third. So throughout my primary school, I was third. And I was so damn good at it where I'll clearly make friends with (laughs) with top students and I knew how much work they did and I just did enough to make sure I was fit. And it changed when I got to standard six, what's that, grade eight, when I went to high school. 
because then I was in a new school, so I had no benchmark, no standards. And then that year then I was first. <laughs> and because I was first, uh, they got the academic scholarship, then that took me to six. But again, uh, that transition from a black education system into uh, JMB, which was a private school education system. So my parents gave me permission and so did my guardian angel. So everyone that I held in high regard told me to temper my expectations. Why? Because I was going from a black education to a white education. So they, they said to me, expect your marks to drop. So what did I do? I became lazy. I just did enough to get by. So I still, I, I didn't graduate with an A aggregate to school. I just did enough to get into two varsity and do what I needed to do. But that's the story of my life. I always held back. And the holding back was my self-sabotage. That's why I guess, I mean, I did well in corporate, but why am I not the CEO of a mutual or these companies are self-sabotaged? I, I did not give anything fully of myself, which is called commitment, right? And I only began to see it in my now life as an entrepreneur. Because as I tell people that it's been a two year transition from corporate mindset into entrepreneurial mindset. And definitely there's a difference between those mindsets. But I'll say within the first two years of my journey, I was hedging myself. As in, everyone came to say, Ben, uh, I know you're doing old capital, but I've got this big gig for you. I would have been open and entertained it. And it was only, seriously, two years later, which was the beginning of this year, 2020, the COVID year, that I say I made a commitment. And the commitment was to say, I'm on a path, I'm committing to it. If I succeed, great. If I fail, it's gonna be so spectacular. But then I'll know deep down <laughs> that I didn't cop out. I didn't uh, make it a hard measure, but that I'm, I've given it my all. And I'll say that's the only difference in my psychology this year compared to previous years. And if I reflect on, I mean, 2020 has been a tough year for most people, but I look at um, us, right? So we've built a business this year, and I kid you not, we built a business in six months. When I say build a business <laughs> in six months, I mean literally that. The beginning of the year was a concept, and the concept's due for the first quarter, and from the second quarter to now, uh, it's a property, social impact property business. We found uh, three development partners, one of which I'm um, using the offices today, that does affordable housing, another one doing co-living, other one doing convenience retail. We've got a pipeline of about two and a half billion zar, which is okay, not much in terms of dollars, but uh, it's significant. And we capital raising, and we're gonna close at least a phase phase now before the end of the year. I mean, and then you talk to anyone to say, what does it mean? I mean, there's a, an investment team of 10. There's 10 of us that did not exist or that were not aligned or did not even know each other. So we met online. We've been online dating and we only met face to face about two weeks ago. So that's what I've done in COVID. And we're going to make huge difference in terms of, again, improving the dignity in terms of human settlements in South Africa and sub sahara and bringing the economy to people via our convenience retail stuff. So that's what I mean then by, I mean, I am an oxymoron. Okay, so but it is self-sabotage. I am a hard worker, but I'm lazy. So lazy for me means I always choose a path of least resistance, which in terms of prices work is actually a good thing. So it's like martial arts vis-a-vis resisting force and energy. Uh, so I'm lazy that way, as in I choose path of least resistance, or I preoccupy myself with taking complex stuff and just making it simple so that we can actually execute and do something about it. That's, that's my superpower and that's what, I, that's what I do well. And I mean, this particular thing about the self-sabotage that you talked about, that, that's pretty interesting. I mean, essentially, well, I, I don't know whether it's self-sabotage or something else, but you are holding yourself back. Um, that could come from multiple uh, things about, yeah, you do not really wish to put yourself in the limelight for whatever reason, um, because that could have been uncomfortable uh, from <clears throat> some past conditioning, whatever. Uh, but how did you finally get over it? Like, for instance, like you said, this year, 
it, these things happen. But obviously, even before that, you were already on a path where you, you started your own business, you were an entrepreneur, you did things which were pretty noteworthy. So what was it that helped you make the shift away from that space of holding back and self-sabotaging as it were? So maybe on reflection, I was lucky that I had bosses or sponsors that believed in me. And maybe I was curious enough to actually reflect and think about why do they believe in me more than I believe in myself because I could see that uh, the difference. And, and one that comes to mind is, is, uh, <clears throat> is uh, my boss who gave me this opportunity with All Mutual Properties to start off with. So when I got appointed as MD of All Mutual Properties, I had zero commercial real estate experience, at zero. Yes, I had investment experience, and he believed in me and my abilities. I mean, I was a, I was a, I was a professional, right? So, which means I achieved results through self. And now I was managing this business of about, I don't know, 320 people. I never managed people to that extent uh, before, but he believed I could, I could do it. So I guess it's, uh, yeah, I was curious, why do you believe in me more than I believed in myself? So then I realized it's because I'm thinking there, as opposed to valuing myself where I should be, to really uh, being impactful. So, <clears throat> so this combination then of having sponsors, people that believed in me, supported me, it just started me on a journey, and uh, and it's just been a continual process, I guess. <coughs> Excuse me, of uh, self discovery to the point of understanding my potential and and actually going for it. Because when I was running on mutual properties, I mean, it was pretty, I mean, it was such a success. I mean, we were 4 billion assets under management. In seven years, we grew the business to 32 billion. I mean, we increased profits, I don't know, by a factor of seven in seven years, which is unheard of. And why is because I was stupid, dumb to dream, dare, and just do. <laughs> I, I had no constraints. Uh, constraints. <clears throat> I guess our constraints, as human beings, we constrain ourselves. So I just allowed myself, I suppose, to just go. And I had this ability to inspire people. And we did great things with uh, ordinary, ordinary people. So there's a question in the audience that kind of relates to this. And I'm going to ask it to you, Ben, but I'm kind of, I'm curious to what Neil's going to say, because it's a generational thing. Um, the question is, for an entrepreneur, how do you hold that space within where you would stop needing outside validation. Um, how do you avoid that leading to self-sabotage? And yes, Ben, please answer, but now you're not an entrepreneur yet. Um, but I want you to answer that too, because I feel like your generation, not millennials, but Generation Z, um, <laughs> you guys know what's up. Like, I feel like your awareness of the world is different. Your the way that you communicate, the way you see race and gender and climate is different. Like I really, I'm relying on you people, like you and younger to fix this. Um, so anyway, Ben, tell us the answer and then Nao can tell us the right one. I forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the question. How do you hold the space? Uh, uh, sorry, how yeah, do you yeah. stop needing uh, yeah. outside validation? Okay, I remember. Um, I guess it's an evolution. I think as we are young, we are that and the world is bigger and the world tells us what we should do and be and when and blah, 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 blah. So my awakening, if I call it that, happened when I was 30, which is by 30, I guess, I don't know, I had achieved all these expectations that society had on me and I was still unhappy and it was like, now what? And it was the now what uh, process which led to self-discovery. So the more work you do on yourself or self-discovery to know who you are, the more work you do on yourself. So that goes up. And that, as that goes up, the extent of external influence actually goes down. So I found then as I spent time to understand who Ben is, what is Ben's purpose and mission in life, <clears throat> what are Ben's values that guide 
the decisions that he make or how he evaluates right and wrong. The more I understood that, the more I practiced it, because uh, then that's where the belief comes in. And uh, effectively, my self-affirmation is going up, right? Because then I place Ben above anything else. And then I then put perspective to opinions of others of me, because they don't know me, they don't know the journey that I've traveled to be the man that I am today. And because of that, then I place a higher, I'm a soul, I believe in myself 100%, maybe 120%. And others' views is just feedback, it's just data that I have to contextualize. And I understand that what people say, feel about me is more a reflection of their journey as opposed to mine. So I can put things into that level of context. And because, and I can only do that because I've done my work, right? And without having done my work, I wouldn't know any better. And that's what keeps me, I guess, in a sense of uh, balance or self-affirmation that then gives you the confidence to do what you need to do in the world in terms of pursuing your dreams and aspirations. Yeah, and just to touch uh, on that, I find it quite interesting because of my generation, because it is uh, technology generation in that sense, where you grow up and you see, I don't know, the media's representation of people. And that is a very, it's a slim margin of what people genuinely look like on the earth. So it's very easy to fall prey to low self-esteem and a lack of belief in yourself. So one thing that I found quite interesting, my dad has a saying that he's recently been saying quite a lot, <laughs> okay. is basically asking, what's your superpower? Yeah. So essentially you have to look within yourself and say, okay, cool, what am I good at? You know, what is something that I'm passionate about? What is something also that I'm not good at yet? Or something that, you know, maybe if you're working in a team, something that someone else can compliment you with, you know? So I think it's in that sense, you have to really look within yourself to find that self-belief. So make a list, write down everything that you find really amazing, incredible, uh, and something that you appreciate about yourself, write it down on a list and go back to it every day. Because the more you acknowledge it, the more it becomes ingrained within you. And then that can help with your self esteem a lot. And the more self esteem you have, the more self confidence you'll have. And the more confidence you have, the more likely, more likely you are to put yourself out there and actually chase your dreams and stop. Uh, I guess, waiting for someone else to give you permission to do it. So that's, that's what I would say. Yeah. Yeah. I have something to ask you. I mean, both of you have a great resonance, right? Um, now, what happens to the times when you feel your father doesn't understand you? You don't get me. So what do you do at that time? I mean, don't tell me that you never face that. Uh, it's rather difficult to believe. But uh, when you do that, what's your coping mechanism? How, how do you resolve it? Um, oh, it's an interesting one. I actually haven't felt like that in a while. I think definitely my earlier teenagers. When I said you can't go to that party you wanted to go to, <laughs> and then you were angry and you went upstairs. You can yeah. tell <laughs> <laughs> generally these happen, this happened quite a few years ago actually but um, obviously you know you get the frustration and the anger but yeah it's one of those things where it's kind of out, out of your control um, it's quite funny because growing up compared to a lot of other parents I'd say my parents were pretty strict so it's, it's something that I've kind of made peace with so the minute you make peace with it you just have less anger I think when you want to fight it a lot of the time, then it just creates a lot of friction. And then that friction gets carried on to just like other parts of the relationship. So I found that just being at peace with it really has helped our relationship more. Cause now, especially after I turned 18, there was, my parents both became a lot more relaxed with me. So it was worth the wait, <laughs> it was the wait, but it was uh, definitely worth it. But usually when it comes to dealing with friction and that anger, um, I know with myself, I can get pretty angry sometimes. And I've just learned that 
rather not to continue that argument in that time because it's very easy to say something that you don't necessarily mean but that is very hurtful you know you just want to hurt someone else so i go to my space listen to some music do something just to calm me down um and then i'll either talk to them about it later or if it's something that i I'm a bit too emotional to talk about, then I'll write a letter or send them a message just to let them know. So the communication is open, but at least it's done uh, from a place where I am open to uh, accept what they have to say and actually listen to what they have to say. And they are open to actually listen to what I have to say. So it's a better, creates better communication between us. So I'll say as parents, Reggie and I, so we've always reasoned to us now and we've always taught her to think, right? So clearly the, problem, the challenging years were the teenage home years when now all she wanted to do was to go to this party because all the girls are going to a party. And some of those parties, Reggie and I were not comfortable. On. So we'll say, okay. Uh, whose party are you going to? Are the parents going to be there? Can we have the parents contact details? Because now we're taking you out of our care into their care. So if she didn't know those details and there was no further conversation, and then uh, if she came with those details, who's going to be there? Who's invited? I mean, it's like give us information so that we can actually understand that you are safe because our job is to keep you safe. And I remember there was a, there was, a, she lied to us uh, in a sense that um, she sold a birthday party. Uh, meanwhile, it was one of these uh, private, public, uh, ravey kind of stories. And, uh, and then she like sold to say, no, there's security. And uh, when we found out that there were kids above 18 and she was not 18 yet, so her mom and I deduced quickly, there's going to be alcohol. And then she says, okay, how are you going to manage the alcohol risk? So we said, we trust you, because then we know you won't necessarily drink. And, uh, but we said, it's not you we're worried about, it's the safety of those other kids drinking and doing stupid things. So tell us whose house, tell us whether the parents are going to be there, security. And as she said, uh, when she's exhausted her reasoning uh, capacity with us, then she gets mad and storms up and goes to her room and the next thing she just writes. Eh? <laughs> That's the one thing she just writes to, to express. And then the last thing about her though, uh, so firstly it's a rule that her mom and I learned uh, that we were taught when we got married is it doesn't matter how much we piss each other off, we never go to bed angry. And it's the same philosophy with no to say I don't care how much we fight, but the rule is, I mean, we kiss and hug before we go to bed. No one goes to bed angry or the next day, we never let that now influence and affect the next day. And I think it was hard at first. And <laughs> well, maybe as you it's say, she became, she became like shifting <laughs> at some point. Uh, maybe it's not so bad, but yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. It, I, I don't think it's just hard at first. I don't think at any point in time it's less hard. But uh, especially if you're a teenager at that age, safety is not really our highest priority. Uh, it's having fun. And, <laughs> and you think that you're immortal, invincible, nothing. <laughs> so, but but uh, yeah, the acceptance is probably... Um, but what you said is, is an amazing rule because... Uh, uh, we, we try and practice it as much as possible, pretty much always, that you never go without resolving the problem before you get to bed. So whatever happens, uh, make sure uh, that gets resolved. That, that, that's one way to really put things in perspective and get out of it. So before we close, one of the things, uh, uh, I, I would go with uh, new first in terms of what are those blind spots in your dad that he doesn't see, but you see and other people see? <laughs> Sorry, he just muttered stubborn. And he doesn't think he is. <laughs> oh, 
gosh, blind spots. Um, you know, he can be pretty set in his ways, but he's still reasonable, which I appreciate. Um, blind spot. Oh my word. We have these family check-ins <laughs> at dinner, which we just, we check in about everyone's day, how you're feeling and everything. And we've timed him a couple of times. He'll go 20, 30 minutes talking straight. <laughs> so he definitely, he does like to talk quite a bit. But uh, besides the little things, I don't think I can think of anything that's like a deep set moral thing that I don't necessarily have an issue with. Okay, so he, he's certainly not uh, one of the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde kind of people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's quite interesting. I think with my dad, we have more of a relaxed relationship. I think because I'm the only child, so it's not like I had someone else to play with uh, growing up. Um, so a lot of the time he filled that role. So we have more of a playful relationship, which is quite nice. So yeah, so not the usual super authoritative father figure. <laughs> but so what, what about uh, Neil's uh, blind spots, uh, Ben? Uh, are you scared to tell her that? Uh, not really. <laughs> uh, that's a good point. So. The one thing I suppose that we brought to her awareness recently is in as much as she says she's a perfectionist and she is a perfectionist, she can be so damn untidy. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, make that point. Uh, her room sometimes, uh, yeah, does not uh, live a state that uh, we would like of our home. But she got to explain it to say as, um, her space is a reflection of her head space. So the clearer her thoughts are, the tidier the room, and the more chaos, the untidier the room. So now I know when a room is untidy, I don't shout at her, I bring us out and say, no, what's wrong? <laughs> 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 yeah, so tidiness is one. Um, yeah. Yeah, the others is just how she is. So she is a perfectionist, which basically means she takes her time, whatever she does, she does properly. I mean, when she cooks, yo, I mean, she'll really research it, go into Pinterest, research the recipe, and, and she makes a whole love affair about it. And she generally does a good job. So for someone like me, who just likes to see things done, I mean, she takes too long, but I understand it's just, kind of like in a, in a makeup. But in many ways, I mean, uh, she, she's a delight, to be, to be honest, she's a, she's a delight. I'll say as parents, I mean, we could have been challenged in more ways than one. I mean, even with the first boyfriend, he was like politely introduced when I go to drop off to, I don't know, actually we were driving and then she asked, she, you know, she thinks she's smart this way. <laughs> because when she starts asking me funny questions like, how old were you and mom when you started dating? And, uh, and, then, and then her uncle likes asking leading questions like that. So, so the mom generally says, no, 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 that's none of your business. What do you want to know? Because she knows this. <laughs> and then I'll answer. And then she'll work it out to say, hmm, so for you and mom to have married to 21, how many girlfriends did you have before mom? <laughs> so and then she'll work it out when, when I started dating. And then when she realized that she was within the sweet spot, and then she says, oh, by the way, dad, I've got a boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And I tell you by that time, I could not have any other argument, right? Except for asking, so who is he? Tell me about it. Where did you meet? When did you meet? <laughs> and I come on and pick it up. And then I'm kind of curious, like stuff like that. So, so that, that kind of detailed research is now showing up in your in her culinary skills as well, right? <laughs> <laughs> Figuring out and then using that as a extremely powerful weapon. Yeah, that, that, that's absolutely great. That's what smart children are. <laughs> I, I have a couple, so they were fantastic. Um, so it, it's such a pleasure, isn't it, learning from your children. I think, I think that's the greatest joy in life uh, for many of us. So it's been so wonderful having you both and having you both in conversation with each other. Uh, so Magda? Yeah, I will, I will close things. Um, I love hearing 
you know, stories of life and how you can just build something amazing. And um, when doors open, walking through them. And I think that's kind of what the lesson for me was. I already like, when I see an open door, I walk through it. Sometimes there's, you know, an angry dog on the <laughs> other side. Um, and I have to throw some treats, but it's okay. I'll figure it out. Uh, but it's, it's, it's cool to hear that even though you said you're lazy, you have made uh, the best opportunities that were given to you. And um, I think we should all do that. When doors open, we should walk through them and we should open doors for others, both because it's polite, but also because you don't know how amazingly you can impact another person when you give given opportunities that they might not have otherwise. Um, that's one thing. And second thing is you talked about um, what you did during COVID, which I think is cool. I don't want to put pressure on anybody and be like, we all have to start new companies or learn piano or whatever it is. It's okay to just be because this time sucks. But it's amazing that you were able to build a company during this time. And we actually have a session tomorrow, um, which will be, it's the morning session. So 7 a.m. Uh, GMT. So 8 a.m. in London, 12.30 lunchtime in India. Um, and that session is going to be a panel on taking, making opportunities, making something good uh, out of what is happening right now, but on a corporate perspective. So if anybody here is watching who wants to hear about uh, what they can do in their business, how they can learn and apply the things that we learned in coaching, um, to leverage the crazy crisis of COVID, please join us. It'll be with one of our alumni, Tina Choi, who's based in Hong Kong. Um, and on that note, I'm going to close and say thank you to our wonderful panelists, Neo and Ben, who are in Stellenbosch, both because they told us and also because we know, because Ben keeps sipping his wine. And I'm <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm That's just, my job normally. Yeah, I, I, I saw Ben in his glass, but you, know, you don't drink, do you? On occasion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, because, uh, I mean, you 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 are not uh, less than eighteen anymore. So, so I, I'm a little curious that uh, you didn't have a matching glass to toast. No, <laughs> no, I've got lectures. Still have work to do. Uh, <laughs> yeah, He's responsible. Yeah, yes, no. again, to our generation, they are the future. They are not drinking when they have lectures to attend, Rob. Yeah, they are more responsible than their parents. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> All right. Correct. All right. <laughs> thank you very much for being there. Wonderful. Thank Take you. care. Good night. Yeah, thank, yeah. thank you, everyone. See you next time. Thanks for having us. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Wow.